First topic for today is customer development. And as I mentioned, customer development is something that runs in parallel with product development. This chapter, Steve Blank, a really smart guy from Silicon Valley, has been significantly involved in eight big startups, six of which were successful, two of which were home runs and hit it right out of the park. And he observed this pattern happening over and over again, that people weren't doing this thing which he started to call customer development. And really, the customer development process that he described is how do you take the customer, the sales side of the business and put it before you build the product? Because the customer is really the horse in this analogy. They, they're pulling your product, and your product is the cart. So if you're, if you're trying to build the product first, you're putting the cart before the horse. And two phrases that you'll hear from me, you've heard get out of the building already. And get out of the building is something that in full will we'll, we'll explain to you that the answers to all of the, your questions are not in this building. So we're going to do some workshop work today. You guys are going to go back and sit at home in boardrooms, steal the time at lunch, and write down a lot of things. Those are all assumptions. And the answers to the questions that you have are definitely not in the building or in the canteen or wherever you are. They're out of the building. They're out of your safe zone, out with customers. So get out of the building is a, is a strident P to go out and speak to people. Don't worry, I'll say it enough today. And then the second part is we talked about the definition of a startup and that frames the question in your mind is what is a startup? And from Steve's point of view, a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable, scalable business model. So the repeatable, scalable business model thing is things that people can generally agree with. So repeatable means you've, you've come up with something that you can do again maybe in different locations and different geographies with different people, you can grow a new team to do it. Scalable means this thing can grow, and the easiest definition of scalable is that your revenue grows faster than your costs. Uh, so it means you can be generating enough revenue to be able to put more money in the bank to be able to grow this thing faster, and a lot of the time software businesses get it easy here because their marginal cost is normally zero, or close to zero. Other businesses need to think about scalability and what it means to build a scalable business. And especially when we get into idea picking, what does scalable mean for your business? How could you scale? How do we change the business model to make it scalable when we get into the assumptions? What's going to hold you back? Posted financials will be the first round. Second round when we get into the business model canvas. How do you price so that you can beat your costs? and not have this stable business stuck in this perpetual loop of just making enough money. Often services business gets stuck in this services trap. How do you move to a product that you can now start to duplicate, get your costs down so you can get higher? Or a franchising of all, there's lots of ways you can do it. Really, there, everybody in this room has a different business idea. Um, but how do, you, how do you scale that up? Because one of the things that's particular to your group is you have a specific funder in mind at the moment and that's eSquared. And eSquared specifically wants you to do high impact businesses. And scalability is a core component to high impact because if it's not scalable you could be awesome and tiny. And that's not having high impact. You might change one or two lives but if you change the structure of the business model how do you get bigger? And so that's the second part, repeatable, scalable business model. The other part, uh, I think, sorry, we don't have name tags today, so dude in the back, um, described it as this early stage of a business and venture. And the idea is that a startup is designed to search and it's temporary. It, it's a little experimental box that you make to try to find this business model. And searching involves a lot of dead ends and not getting things right. And finding a business model is most reliant on finding customers. It, you can build pretty much any product, you can operationalize pretty much any business, and the cart before the horse problem is that people go and they typically start by building a company, then trying to grow customers, then figuring out 
all those real people, and they'd be like, actually, who are our customers? Did we know them? Right? When it doesn't work. Yeah, and it typically doesn't work, and large corporate product development is typified by this. We design the product, it seems great, our market analysis is right, we're gonna build it, we build it, we put it in front of customers, it's not working, well, we get a good sales team, we, put the, we can sell anything, and then our world has been badly served by salespeople who can serve, sell anything. Because they can sell anything, but maybe they shouldn't sell anything. Um, and then, at some point, the sales team talks to the product team and says, well, the customers don't really like this part. And then the product team says, oh, could have told us earlier. <laughs> what? And you could have told us earlier is the most important thing. What's the earliest point that I can tell you is before you've built any product. Yeah. It's really easy to change the product before you've built the product. <laughs> um, and yeah. I was just going to ask about the exceptions to the rules. So for example, I was thinking about Twitter. Yeah. Twitter as an offshoot from the company that they had, so it was just basically a project, right? Yeah. And I think for a long time, we were trying to figure out, you know, who are our customers, yeah. how do we monetize our customers, so what about the exception to the rule, and what circumstances can you build something that's very ambiguous? Yeah. So, importantly, this runs in parallel with product development. You're stepping ahead here, which is good. So how do you, in the beginning, check that there are people out there, and then how do you validate that these are our customers? Sometimes you'll need to build this thing called an MVP, a minimum viable product, a small piece of product to check if it's gonna work. And sometimes, if you're in biotech or space, that might be a multi-million or even billion rand smallest experiment you could conduct. Most of the businesses we deal with the smallest experiment you conduct is writing some assumptions down on a piece of paper and going out to talk to people. Or making a paper mock-up of it and going out to show it to people to see if it catches with them. And sometimes you want to run longer experiments. But really the focus of what we're doing is helping you to understand how to run low-cost experiments. And Twitter was even a low-cost experiment. They didn't go out and spend the billions that have been spent on Twitter today saying, we know people will come. I don't know if you've seen the early stage Twitter, but it was horrendous as, in terms of what it looked like. And then people started using it, and then they used ads to mention people and hashtags to create subtopics. And then Twitter was like, oh, people are using it like this. We're going to build them in. And then we're going to let people search by hashtags. And really, the customer led that development. But so what happened? Twitter started as an SMS platform. Yeah. So you could SMS a group of people, like, yeah. what you were doing. And it's like, I'm doing this. And you SMS your group. Yeah. It, was, it was actually more like WhatsApp is today. Yeah. Like that's how Twitter started. Yeah. So even that, they didn't start with what Twitter is now. They just started with an assumption, gave it to some customers, found people who were using it, and as they started using it differently, they validated it differently, and then oh, as they created those, people went to customers like, oh, brands need to actually make money off this, this is how we'll make the money. We need to shift the platform, the product development, to meet the customer development use case. So, I mean, Step one is really finding out that there are people who have the problem you think they have, which is customer discovery, which we either have built or just designed the right product that fits the customer's needs in step one. In step two, we identify the market for our product, and to identify a market, we actually need to sell something to that market, otherwise we've just imagined the market. And you'll see there's this nice little arrow that comes back here after step two called the pivot, when you go out and you find that that market doesn't exist, or it's different to what you thought and you need to change your product. In the military, they have this term, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Here, no business model survives contact with the customers. The second you take it out, it's gonna change. And so we need to build a series of lightweight tools that you don't get too invested in a plan, because not only is it time and money, it's emotions, and emotions are the killer. Once you're into this thing, you're not going to want to hear what people have to say. You're not going to hear their problems, and you're not going to hear what you should be building. Um, so if you've built a whole product already, you're not going to hear what your customers are saying, uh, which is what sales teams typically do. So the... Sorry. Yeah. How do you know it's the right thing? Like, what if you just like bad spot? Oh, exactly, like right. You are around a whack. So what, what, so what happens is you go out, and you talk to people, and they don't want what you want. Yeah. Now you're back in here. This is an iterative process. I didn't find customers. Do I go look somewhere else? Okay. Or do I go talk to them differently? Okay. 
but you found out you were in a bad spot really cheaply. <laughs> The, 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 other, the other step to that is you, you, you find the customers, these are my customers, I've discovered them, they have this problem. And then you go to them to try and get them to use your product, to use your service, and for some reason they don't want your service, so they don't want that, or there's some reason why that doesn't take off, and that means you haven't validated it, so go back and find some more customers, find that a different means, customer problem. They're not your customers, you know? Yeah, they're not your customers. <laughs> like, if you can't validate them to actually use your product, then they're not your customers, so go back and find better, go discover better customers. Mm. Um, if they do use your product, then it's like, great, well, can we move to the next customer creation of actually getting them to pay for the product? But and that becomes the next so job. How do you make sure you don't get stuck in believing that, okay, I just need to find different customers uh, because these, when do you know that the product is the issue, not the customer? So this is a hard process. Um, the book that describes this is called The Four Steps to the Epiphany. Don't try to read it, it's just business school notes, so it's really hard to the next iteration of that book is called the Startup Owner's Manual, which is more readable. But both of them are quite heavy, and this is a pricey of them. But the epiphany is this idea that you're going to go through this process, and you're going to go talk to customers, get to know their problems, talk to customers, get to know their problems, try to solve their problems, try to solve their problems, try to solve their problems. And then one day you're going to wake up and go, ah, aha, <coughs> that's the epiphany. So these are the four steps to get into that epiphany. Um, rather than building a product and then years in and millions of dollars in going, oh, I figured out what my customer wants. This is how to get deep in your customer and let, I don't know if you guys, like Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell, popular psychology, writes this book called Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. You kind of need to load your brain with all of this stuff until one day you wake up and you figure it out. And you go, either I was doing the wrong thing, this is the right thing, or this is what everyone says they don't have my problem. But they do, they just can't see it. They say, hey, I have this other problem. Then you'll find the missing link, and suddenly people will say, yes, I need that to solve this. So and, that's, yeah. And most importantly in that is getting out and talking to the customers. Mm -hmm. And it's about getting out of the building and getting data and validated, validation that these are your customers and this is, what, this is what they want the problem, which is what this whole process is about. So this whole process is gonna teach you a series of techniques and things to get, up, get your idea out of the building, either with a minimum viable product or a customer interview, um, a bunch of other things. And there's this wonderful analogy uh, from a guy called Kent Beck. Anyone know who he is or heard of extreme programming? So it's this thing from the 90s. And he's a really, really smart guy who's luckily found a bunch of things that work in software and been able to help the world get much better at doing software. But he got into startups and when he encountered the lean startup and all these techniques, he gave a talk back in I think it was in 08, um, or 2010, anyway, a few years ago, um, in which he, he described how he understood this process. So we, we, we're all a diverse community here, so I don't know where you guys come from, but anyone that spent time on a farm with goats? Anybody? Anyone like familiar with goats? Yeah? Okay, so a few hands have gone up. Go, goats are naughty little things, right? Um, so Kent Beck stood up in front of a room of, of city-dwelling Americans and he told the story. I really didn't know why he was telling the story. You're not going to know why I'm telling the story until then. But, so he, he went out to the back lot on his, on his farm and this goat comes up and it starts butting up against his leg. And so you start scratching a goat because if you don't scratch a goat, it doesn't stop bugging. You know? So it's like you, know, you give it some attention and then it's kind of happy and he's scratching the goat on its head. Scratching, scratching, the goat is kind of being put away. Scratching, scratching, scratching down the chest. And then he finds a spot on the hip here. And suddenly the goat goes, <laughs> And this goat is just like so happy. And it's like paroxysms of goaty ecstasy. <laughs> and you're wondering why I'm telling you the story. Because that's kind of what it's like when you're doing startups. You scratch. You do the same thing over and over again until you find the itchy spot. The goat had an itchy spot, your market has an itchy spot. And if you scratch where it's itching, suddenly you'll get this response. <laughs> and you'll be like, I'm doing the same thing I was doing yesterday, why can I, does my phone not stop ringing today? Because you chose a new channel, you addressed a new customer, you tried something different and suddenly what you have has gone viral, it's done this, it's, you know, everybody's talking about it, they can't get enough about it. Did you change your pricing model? Did you start charging more? And now suddenly people want to buy it. Um, 
Did you start charging less? Did you give it away for free? What did you change? Did you talk to the, suddenly when I go out and talk to customers, everyone's excited because I'm using the word gold instead of, you know, what, what can we change? How do we pitch this thing? We don't know. I definitely don't know what's going to work for your business, but I can teach you how to scratch. Um, which is important because another fun story comes from around customer development because customer discovery involves a lot of customer interviews, going out and talking to people. And people will often tell you that they don't have the problem that you have. Yo. Sorry um, to discuss. Uh, no. I just have a question. How much of this can you do yourself over and over and over? Does it get to a point where you might need someone else to do your help? Yes. Because like, I had a business and it was doing well. I got people to pay for it. Mm. It didn't quite work out. But um, it got to a point where I was too emotionally involved, and when it crashed, like I died. Yeah. Literally. So I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> so I'm asking how much can you, of yourself should you invest in customer development, and how much can you sort of outsource if I can put it that way? So importantly, we go through another, I mean, don't, be, don't apologize. It's a very good question and a good story. You know, we can crash, and especially if we don't know that there are these steps, we found customers, we validated we can address those customers. Now we go into customer creation, which is scaling and marketing and growing the business. And if that doesn't work, we can come back. But oftentimes we'll keep trying to grow something that's not growing. And then there is very importantly company building. So once you've found something that works, you don't keep soloing it, you build a company. You hire people, you do HR, you do recruiting, you grow the business, and then you move into general management. This is startup management, then you move into general management. The, the way you run a business, and how do you, the, the transition of an entrepreneur into delegating, actually getting hands off on your business, letting other people do things. And those are the hard lessons that come then. This stuff comes now. Um, so, we're going to go out and we're going to talk to people and we're going to hear things that don't work. Um, who here in like, early English readers came across Dr. Seuss? The cat in the hat? Uh, Sam I am? The green eggs, I have, green eggs and ham? Anybody remember that book? Vaguely? Philip, no one else? Okay, so, so Dr. Seuss was a very interesting guy and he came up with a whole bunch of challenges. The challenge for green eggs and ham was to write a book with the fewest words Possible. I think he wrote it with 90 odd words for a whole book for kids. And so it's very repetitive. And it really feels like customer development. It's very repetitive. And it's a story about this little dude, Sam I am, who comes up to the cat uh, to the cat in the hat and says, Do you like green eggs and ham? And he says, I do not like green eggs and ham. And so then the cat in the hat says, Would you eat them in a house? Would you eat them with a mouse? And he said, I would not eat them in a house, I would not eat them with a mouse. And mm -hmm. uh, so he said, okay, would you eat them in a car? Nope, I would not eat them in the car. Would you eat them on a boat? Would you eat them with a goat? I could not eat them in a, a boat, I would not eat them with a goat. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am. And he goes through this and he says, well, would you eat them on a train? Would you eat them in, a in the rain? Would you eat them in the dark? I would not, would not, would not eat green eggs and ham. And each page, you know, similar words, I'm just not going to do it. Until eventually the train has crashed into the sea and they're there like half drowning in the sea and he's bedraggled and finally the customer says, and so Sam I'm says to him, try them and you'll see. He says, if I try these green eggs and ham, would you be? <laughs> and, and Sam I'm says, try them, try them and you'll see. And he eats the green eggs and ham. I do so like green eggs and ham. <laughs> I like them, Sam I am. So eventually Sam found the way to talk to his customer. I'm not suggesting you beat your customers up. <laughs> <laughs> but he, like, at the end he's delighted. He says, thank you, thank you, Sam I am. I do so like green eggs and ham. Your customer will be delighted when you finally get through to them. And in this process of asking the same question of customers, they, they may tell you they don't want you what, don't want you what you have, but if your vision is strong enough and you can get through to them eventually, you can go with it. But at some point you might realize green eggs and ham actually suck, and you might try to sell them yellow eggs and pink ham, but that might be better. You're allowed to change your product too. Sam I am was the sort of determined, classical, 
product development guy who had green eggs and ham on a plate and he had to sell them. But still think about what would you change about the green eggs and ham. No one really wants green eggs and ham, but actually they were nice. But the customer couldn't see that, so how did you change that up? It's an interesting story. Um, if you've got like kids or nephews and nieces, buy the book, read it to them at night, it'll might spur you on. I've got two kids, I've got a two and a half year old and an eight month old, so I get to read the book at least once a week. Um, it's a good reminder of all this stuff. So, coming up with customer development, step one, have we built the right product features? Have we identified the market for, market for our product? And then you'll get mentors and advisors and people who will talk to you about growth and sticky growth and scaling your business and all This is customer creation. Once you've figured this stuff out, then you go and you try to beat the um, drum of getting customers to you. And then after that, you go and build a company. And that's in, in the framework you guys are in now, that's accelerator time. Now we're in the search phase. We're trying to find something. And if you've got an existing business, let's maybe try to find easier routes to customers, understand your customers better and go there. I said to Roger I'd spend a bit more time on customer development today, and I have, uh, but I think I've really done my stay on customer development.